Yeah, thanks. Um, so yeah, I'm thrilled to be here. Um, we have four speakers from the Tilburg Meta Science Group. Uh, each one of us is going to focus on a different aspect of the research process and uh, also provide some ways that we can maybe improve them. Uh, so we'll jump right to it. First up, we have Hilda, who will discuss uh, peer review. So go ahead and take it away when you're ready. Yes, thank you, Rick. I'll, let me see, to share the screen. I think this should be working, so hopefully you can all uh, see me now. Uh, so welcome everyone. I will be talking about the evaluation of scientific manuscripts and more specifically about peer review, as well as thesis grading. So as you all probably know in the published literature, how let me, yeah, there we are. In the published literature, and especially in psychology and psychiatry, the research fields I work in, there are is an overabundance of statistically significant results in the published literature. So over 90% of studies uh, support tested hypothesis. And uh, maybe we're just really great at doing research and we have very plausible hypothesis. Uh, but this doesn't seem to be the case since we have extremely small sample sizes with a median sample size of 62. Uh, and this is not sufficient for the small to medium effect sizes that we generally investigate. Uh, so that results in low power, which is estimated to be 0.5 or even 0.35 uh, for psychology. Uh, furthermore, we know that there's a lot of publication bias, there are questionable research practices going on, and people have a lot of reporting errors in their studies. Uh, and all of this has resulted, as you're probably aware, in a so-called replication crisis, where uh, prominent studies uh, published uh, within all kinds of research fields have turned out to be very difficult uh, to replicate. And that makes us wonder how do these apparently not replicable studies end up in the literature and what kind of quality control do we have? So for the published literature, we have uh, peer review as quality control. So peer review should act as a gatekeeper to make sure that published literature is of high quality. And um, we already know that uh, peer review is uh, the best uh, option we have, uh, but it isn't very uh, perfect. Uh, we know that peer reviewers often disagree. You might have experienced this yourself as well when you get feedback and uh, uh, things are going wrong there as well. So what do they actually pay attention to? What are their quality criteria? What do they think is important when they look at a, uh, at a manuscript? And peer reviewers have a second job often as academic staff where they also teach their students. And it also makes me wonder whether these academics, the people who educate the new generation of researchers, what do they teach their students? Uh, do they preach what they uh, shouldn't practice? Do they preach what they actually should practice? Uh, and what is it that students implicitly learn or explicitly learn in our thought? So uh, for the published literature, we had peer review and in education, we have grading as a system to check the quality of the student's work. And specifically, we will be looking at the grading of the master's thesis, which is the final project usually that a student has before they graduate. Uh, so what do we pay attention to when they, the teachers when they grade these theses and what do students believe is of importance to their supervisor? So our main research question for this research project was uh, which characteristics of a manuscript, being it either an article or a thesis, do uh, students and researchers believe to be of importance when assessing the quality of this scientific manuscript? So which aspects influence assessed quality? Is there a difference when they're assessing the quality of a submitted article versus when they're uh, assessing the quality of a thesis? And do students and researchers differ in their quality assessment of these theses? So we set up a study, which was a vignette and survey study. We pre-registered this study on OSF um, and our participants were both students and researchers. So for the participants uh, among the researchers, we uh, emailed uh, a lot of authors and editors who had published within psychology in the past few years. And we had three rounds of sampling. And then we ended up with 687 uh, usable and complete responses after two months. Uh, for the students, this turned out to be a bit more difficult. We used social media and our, as well as our own network. Uh, however, this didn't went very smooth. Facebook uh, kept deleting our messages and stuff like that. And after 11 months of data collection, we decided to close it. And we had only 113 usable and complete responses. 
So therefore, we decided that all hypotheses and analysis that include the data from the students should be considered exploratory because we do, did not reach the power that we intended. So first, we had the vignette study part. There we had 32 conditions. So participants were either a student or a researcher. And they were all asked to read an abstract of a scientific manuscript. And for students, this was, they were told that this was the abstract of a thesis. For researchers, there were two conditions. It was either a thesis or a submitted article. And within the abstract, we manipulated three factors. So the abstract itself was on test anxiety. Uh, and we manipulated the sample size, which was either small or large. Uh, there was either a reporting error present or not. And the results of the main hypothesis were either statistically significant or not. Uh, we asked all participants to read the abstract carefully and then to rate the quality of the manuscript on a seven point scale and to name three aspects that were relevant for their quality assessment. So for the vignette study, uh, we hypothesized that sample size would matter. So large sample sizes would yield uh, higher quality ratings, that statistical significance would matter, and that the reporting errors would not matter. Uh, when we looked at the results, we saw that there was only a small but a statistically significant predictor effect of the sample size being small or large, but we found no effect of significant or non-significant uh, uh, results or being an error or no error present. So for the first two uh, uh, sub-hypotheses, we saw that sample size mattered, statistical significance didn't, uh, but we hypothesized there would be no effect of the reporting error, so we cannot answer this with frequency statistics. So we used uh, Bayesian posterior model probabilities, and there we saw a lot of evidence for the null effect. So we can conclude that the reporting error did indeed not matter. We also looked at the open uh, question, where we asked them to name three relevant uh, aspects for their quality rating. And there we saw that they mentioned sample size or power 160 times, so in 23% of the responses. Uh, the non-significance or significance of the results were only mentioned three times, and the error in the p-value was never mentioned. So it seems that nobody noticed that there was an error, or at least they didn't think it was important for their quality rating. For our second hypothesis, we hypothesized that there would be an interaction effect on the article and thesis for, with the three uh, aspects that we manipulated. And there we saw no interaction effects. So thesis is generally uh, rated as higher quality than when they think it's an abstract of an article, uh, but there are no interaction effects with the three factors we manipulated. Um, and for the student versus article, this was the same. So students rate the abstract as higher quality than the researchers, uh, but there were no interaction effects there. Then uh, after the vignette study, all participants uh, received the survey study. Um, and there they were asked to rate 29 different items on the importance when they assess the quality of a manuscript. And these items were all related to either the theory, uh, the design of the um, research, uh, research conduct or analysis and presentation of the results. Um, there were six conditions here. So uh, participants were still either a student or an academic. Uh, for the academics, they received either a thesis or an article condition. Uh, and they were asked uh, to uh, either to assess the quality of the, uh, when they would, what was important to them when they were assessing the quality of a manuscript, or what was important to them when they were grading a thesis or when they uh, assessed the publishability of a manuscript to see whether there were differences between assessing the quality or assessing whether it's fit for publication. And here we have the results of our 29 items for all the different conditions. And uh, what you see in general is that when uh, uh, that all con conditions or all groups were kind of similar. So uh, they either think an item is important or not that important, um, but they all kind of agree and they show the same patterns for all the different items. So for the sample size, which we manipulated in the, uh, in the uh, vignette part, we saw that they were only of moderate importance. So these are either having a large sample size or achieving a high statistical power. For the uh, Error-free reporting, sorry, for the, uh, my bad, for the sample sizes, yeah. For the statistical significance, we saw that they told 
so they thought that that was not uh, very important to them. Uh, this is either observing large effect sizes, observing the main effect in the hypothesis direction, or uh, in, uh, reaching statistical significance of the results of the main hypothesis. Uh, students think that this is slightly more important compared to researchers, or that it will be more important to their supervisor uh, than their supervisor actually thinks or the peer reviewer actually thinks. For the error-free reporting, we see that they rate this as uh, quite important, and they actually state that it is uh, that reporting the statistical results without errors uh, is uh, of importance to them when they assess the quality. Then we also looked at uh, responsible research practices, uh, which we did not pre-register, but we were interested in this uh, anyway. Um, and we uh, thought, what is of importance to them there? Uh, doing a power analysis was only moderately important. Pre-registering part of the study was also only moderate important, as well as sharing data, materials, or analysis code. Uh, and please note that for both uh, pre-registration as well as sharing, uh, apparently the students, which are the uh, diamond-shaped uh, figures, uh, are uh, think that this is more important than their supervisors do or the peer reviewers do. So our new generation apparently thinks that this is more important than the old, older generation. Um, and uh, furthermore, we also asked them for the distinguishing confirmatory from exploratory analysis, and that they thought was of higher importance, especially the, the researchers. So to conclude, uh, surprising to us was that reviewers did not seem to be a great source of publication bias. It had no impact on the quality rating of the abstract, and it was also rated as one of the least important characteristics. Uh, Sample size did seem to be of importance, so this is, well, had a significant impact on the quality rating of the abstract, but it was only rated as moderately important in the survey part. And statistical uh, reporting errors uh, are of importance. They are rated as very important, but they're really hard to spot. And we also know this from earlier research that peer reviewers have a hard time spotting errors, uh, and it had no impact on the quality rating, and nobody mentioned uh, the error in the open-ended question. Uh, and finally, responsible research practice uh, indicates are not rated as super important. Okay, that was it. Thank you for your attention. Great, thanks so much. Uh, so I see we have one question already. Um, so which field of study were the participants from? Yeah, so uh, they were all from, uh, they all published within a topic of psychology. And uh, we asked them what uh, field they were in. So I can actually, I have a slide on that here as well. Let me go quickly there. Uh, yeah, just a sec, almost there. So um, the participants were from all kinds of uh, continents, so both the students as well as the researchers. Uh, yeah, for, uh, the study phase of the students was mainly bachelor and, so, and master students. Uh, for the uh, academics, this was all kinds of, uh, um, of career phases. And these are the research fields that they were from. So it's quite diverse. Social psychology and applied psychology are the largest ones. And the other category are, uh, of course, is a bunch of all kinds of descriptions that people had, but they all published within psychology. Yeah. Okay, great. So mostly psychology. Um... I'm not sure if there are any other questions. If not, I would ask one. Uh, so I, I find this, there's no difference between significant versus non-significant vignettes and how they're evaluated. I wonder if you could just opine on how we square that with the excess of significant results we see in the literature. Yeah, I think that that is very interesting. Um, so uh, we, it surprised us, we expected that peer reviewers would uh, maybe not explicitly state that they, in the survey part, that they it would, uh, was important for, to them, uh, but we definitely expected that it would have an effect in the, in the vignette study. Um, so it could be that uh, the peer reviewers are actually not a, a big part of this. Uh, maybe it is really about uh, the actual authors not sending it in. Uh, I don't know, uh, but it is interesting uh, definitely to see this, yeah. Great, and then we'll do one quick last question. Um, Gabriel asks, why do you think that statistical mistakes are hard to detect? Yeah, they're really hard to spot just with the eye. 
So you do have special software such as StatCheck, which is used more often now and also uh, already at the journal levels, uh, which I think is great uh, because we do find it important. So this st stretches the importance of this kind of software. If we do not want errors in there, uh, we should uh, 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 facilitate the reviewers to spot this because it's really difficult to really see this with the, with the uh, eye and uh, software could uh, definitely help with that. Um, this was also in our vignette, we, it was a small error, so it was statistically significant and it remained statistically significant uh, even without the error uh, because we did not want to influence it being either statistically significant or not uh, because that would also impact uh, other aspects of, uh, of the peer review as well. Yeah. Okay, great. Thanks. Well, uh, we're out of time there, so let's go ahead and move on to the next talk. Uh, so next up, we have Marianne, who will be discussing uh, whether sample sizes have increased in response to the replication crisis. Uh, go ahead and take it away. Yes, thank you. So as said, I want to talk about, let's see, yes, yeah. I want to talk about uh, sample sizes in psychology. Uh, Hilda also tells about uh, something about sample sizes in uh, and, and how they are evaluated by uh, researchers when they have to peer review or evaluate the thesis. Um, but she also stated that uh, in psychology, uh, uh, yeah, power, statistical power is typically quite low uh, because the sample sizes are uh, are low. And of course, the the yeah the most the easiest way to uh, increase this statistical power is to increase the sample sizes. Um, and we have quite some studies that investigate statistical power already starting by uh, Cohen in 1965, if I'm correct. Uh, but sample sizes directly are not that often investigated. Um, but there is uh, at least one study who did this, and this was published in 2011. This is a study by uh, Marsalek, Barber, Kohlhardt, and Holmes. And um, they looked at uh, uh, studies published in 1955, 1977, 1995, and 2006. And these first two uh, years uh, were already used by Holmes uh, in some older publications. And uh, Marsalek had all added the latter two uh, years because they wanted to know whether um, the sample sizes increased as a response to the Wilkinson and uh, task, the Task Force on Statistical Inference from 1999. Um, but as you can see, I uh, showed here the, the median sample size of the four journals that they include. So they had four psychological journals from different fields in psychology. You can see that it no, not really increase, maybe even a decrease, but not really evidence of an increase over in sample size over time. Um, but of course, a lot of things happened after uh, 2011. Uh, we had the replication crisis and followed uh, by uh, different initiatives to improve psychological science. So we had pre-registrations, registered reports, awarding open science badges, increased focus on direct replications and null results, um, and also an increased attention to the problems of small sample sizes. So we were wondering uh, whether we could update this uh, Marsalek et al. study to see whether uh, sample sizes in psychology have increased um, after the publication crisis. So we wanted to add a new uh, year to this data and add 2019 because uh, of course then we had uh, all the researchers would have had some time to uh, yeah, incorporate these new changes and see uh, whether that has an effect on the sample sizes. So um, these were our research questions. So uh, our question was uh, mainly have uh, sample sizes increase over time. Um, and uh, we also wanted to know whether this was as a response to the replication crisis. So to see whether the, the uh, sample sizes from before and after whether they differed. Um, but we also wanted to know whether there were uh, uh, whether journal level policies might have an influence on the sample sizes. So we wanted to compare uh, journals who uh, really focus on open science practices, also with journals that uh, doesn't focus on open science practices, um, and also whether um, differences on the paper level um, might have an effect. So uh, whether uh, studies that um, uh, uh, 
practice more uh, open and open science. So have, for example, open science batches, whether they have higher sample sizes than uh, studies who uh, don't do that. So to do that, we used uh, the original data from uh, Marsalek et al. Um, so uh, we had full data from the years 1995 and 2006. So the older data wasn't available anymore. Um, and uh, this um, was data, the sample sizes from uh, four journals. So it was abnormal psychology uh, of the Journal of Abnormal Psychology, Journal of Applied Psychology, Journal of Experimental Psychology and Developmental Psychology. We added uh, 2009 uh, volumes of the same journals. And we added two journals that focus also more on open science practices and award, for example, batches, so psychological science and journal of experimental social psychology. And we also hope that it would cover a broader range of topics in psychology. And of all those um, uh, 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 articles that are published in these volumes, we collected the sample sizes. Um, and um, here you can see how many sample sizes we uh, collected. And that was a total of more than uh, 3,000 sample sizes. But I also have to uh, give a warning because these are preliminary results. So we did a pre-registration and one of the things is that we also need to uh, check a, a part of the, of the uh, collected sample sizes. So do uh, an additional check to that. And I didn't have time to do that before this talk, but I still wanted to present some of the results already. Um, but uh, yeah, just a warning that it's uh, preliminary. Um, but you can see that we have a lot of sample sizes, uh, but there's also some differences in the, the number of sample sizes uh, in the different uh, journals, uh, with quite a lot of sample sizes in Journal of Experimental Psychology, for example, um, and relatively less uh, uh, sample sizes from uh, Journal of uh, Abnormal Psychology and Journal of Applied Psychology. And here we can see the uh, box plots for the different journals and the different years. Um, so the colors are the different journals. And um, uh, yeah, the, the, for every journal, we have uh, three box plots. And uh, the first one is 1995, the second one 2006, and the last one 2019. Um, of course, uh, I, I, uh, there are also some very high sample sizes sometimes. Uh, especially from people that use uh, survey data from uh, big uh, sur uh, public surveys. Um, so I uh, only show uh, until a thousand participants because otherwise it didn't really fit in the, in the figure. Um, and if we look a little bit to the median uh, over time, then yeah, there might be indeed some kind of an increase over time uh, for uh, the different journals. Um, and uh, here you can see that as well. If we look at the different uh, the medians for the uh, sample sizes for the different journals, um, there's also seem also to be a difference between the journals. For example, Journal of Experimental Psychology has a relative low uh, median sample size, uh, but um, Journal of Experimental Psychology also contains a lot of studies uh, with a, within subject design. Um, and we see the, the highest numbers for Journal of uh, Applied Psychology. Um, so in here, we can also see it in the table. So for the different journals and also the, uh, the, for the total uh, median sample size. And then we see that in 1995, the median sample size was 40. In 2006, it was uh, 57. And 2019, it is uh, 120. So there seems to be an increase, and we uh, also tested that with a multi-level model with a negative binomial to uh, incorporate uh, uh, the, the, the distribution of the data. And we indeed found a significant effect of uh, sample sizes over time. Um, or uh, second and third uh, question were more about uh, whether it was a reaction on the replication crisis. So we compared 2019 papers with the ones before. Um, and also whether there was this difference between journals. So we compared the, uh, the two new journals that focus more on open science with the older journals, uh, the, the original journals. Um, and we didn't find an interaction effect. So we 
uh, don't see a stronger increase in journals that practice open science uh, practices. So we don't find any confirmation of our third hypothesis. Um, uh, however, the main effect of uh, replication crisis was significant. So we see indeed this difference between uh, sample sizes of studies before the uh, open science, uh, before the replication crisis and after the replication crisis. Um, and then we also wanted to look at um, the difference between papers with and without open science badges. And therefore we can only look at papers from 2019 and only from Journal of Experimental Social Psychology and uh, uh, Psychological Science, because they uh, award these badges. Um, and if we combine those two journals, then we see that uh, the median sample size uh, of the uh, papers that uh, have no badge is 160, and for uh, the ones with a badge, it's 190. Um, so there, uh, yeah, you see some, uh, it, it is a little bit higher. However, if we test that with a Wilkie-Coxon rank uh, sum test, then it's not significant. So it's not a significant difference. Um, we also checked it for the two uh, papers, uh, for two journals separately. And then we uh, did not find a significant effect for Journal of Experimental Social Psychology. Um, but we did find an effect for uh, psychological science. Um, so to conclude, um, we see some increase in sample size over time, which might be a reaction to the replication crisis and the reforms that followed uh, onto this. Um, and this increase seems to be general and not uh, dependent on open science practices on the journal level. Uh, and we see some mixed results about the difference in sample size between papers with and without open science badges. But of course, there could be other reasons also involved. So it might be that, um, yeah, papers that have larger sample sizes also um, investigate topics that are uh, uh, for which it's easier to get these larger sample sizes, but also to get these badges. So there might, of course, other explanations uh, to be involved. Um, so uh these were my uh, conclusions so uh, i just want to thanks say thanks to you and also to uh, jake who helped uh, with uh, setting up the study and giving more information about our original data collection and also uh, ifona who helped me with uh, collecting all the sample sizes from the papers great thanks again um okay so we have a few questions coming in uh one we have, you mentioned the problem that within subjects designs generally have smaller sample size. Could the sample size per study condition be a fair metric to compare studies regardless of their experimental design? Yeah, that's a, a good thing. Um, so one of the things that we uh, I look now and I only presented the results for the uh, total sample sizes, but if they uh, compare different conditions, then we also collected individual uh, data sizes. So that means the, the individual group sizes. Um, and uh, so we are also going to look into that as well, um, because, of course, as you said, it, it is important to take also the research designs into account, especially if you want to say something about uh, the power of, uh, of a study. Um, but yeah, that's still uh, something that we need to do. Great. Uh, there are a few more questions. I think what we're going to do is just move on for now, and then we can revisit these at the end of the session uh, just to make sure we can get through in time. Uh, so unfortunately, our, our third speaker can't be here today, but we got the next best thing. He sent along a video. Uh, so next we'll hear from Robbie about uh, a project assessing errors in COVID preprints. Uh, so we can go ahead and play that video. Okay, here we go. So uh, do shout if this isn't working for any reason. Welcome everyone. Unfortunately, I couldn't present in person due to other obligations, and that's why I pre-recorded this, uh, this presentation. And this presentation will be about a registered report that we are actually currently working on about statistical inconsistencies in COVID-19 preprints. So we're working on this uh, project, which means that we are currently collecting the data. 
So I cannot share you any results, but I can tell you something about the setup of the study and what we are actually planning to do. So this is work together, mainly together with uh, Michel Nuyten, but also with other members of uh, our research group at uh, Tilburg University. And the study is about the quality of COVID-19 research. Because what we know is that there is currently some sort of information explosion with respect to COVID-19 research. A lot of research on COVID-19 gets published now. And what we also know is that there are these special fast track review procedures in order to be able to publish studies on COVID-19 very quickly. And we also know that these studies are more often shared prior to publication, for instance, in terms of um, a preprint. And then the question that we are interested in is, does actually this high-speed science, does it negatively influence the quality of research? Because what we know is that based on the seminal work from uh, John uh, Ioannidis, in 2005, we know that if there are financial or other interests, that this will lower the likelihood of a finding being true. So in case of COVID-19 research, there are definitely financial and also other interests which may play a role. And another factor is the extent to which research field is hot. And in this on COVID-19 research, there are many different uh, teams involved who are doing research on COVID-19 research. So this is also an important factor that's actually also playing a role here. And what we also know is that based on some studies that have already been conducted to study the methodological quality of COVID-19 research, that the methodological quality could only be evaluated as high in 41% of the COVID-19 studies. So this was uh, determined based on applying the standard quality checklists to these studies. And if you compare this 41% uh, to the control group, then what you see is that 73% of the studies in the control group were of high methodological quality. So this already indicates also together with some other research that I do not have time to discuss right now, that the quality of the study seems to be lower in COVID-19 research compared to non-COVID-19 research. So this motivated us to look at another indicator of the quality of research and that's the statistical reporting. Because incorrect, reporting of a statistical result might lower the, the confidence in a study. So if you see a study with a statistical inconsistency in it, then you might put less trust in the study in general. Examples of statistical inconsistencies are, for instance, a percentage that doesn't match up the event and the total sample size. So for instance, if there, if there is stated that seven out of 100 participants uh, were infected by COVID, uh, by the coronavirus, then, and there's also reported that this is 5%, and this is, of course, a statistical inconsistency. And another type of inconsistency is, for instance, if an odds ratio is reported, but if also a two by two frequency table is reported, and these two are not in line with each other, then this is also a statistical inconsistency if this recomputed odds ratio based on the two by two table is not in line with the reported odds ratio. And the hypothesis that we want to test is whether the prevalence of statistical reporting inconsistencies differs between COVID-19 and matched non-COVID-19 uh, preprints. And the good thing is that we have a population of studies because we are going to look at preprints and at preprints that are published between January 2020 and the end of January 20, the end of January 2021 on the preprint service MedArchive and 
bioarchive. And the reason that we focus on these preprints is that, first of all, they play a central role in disseminating research on COVID-19, um, on COVID-19, and they can also be easily located since they are published on these preprint servers. So we really have a population. And this is important because we can use this population to draw a random sample from. And we draw a stratified random sample of this population of preprints using a uh, straight out the number of authors. Because you can imagine that um, if there are multiple authors involved, then people might uh, check the statistical results, whether these are reported in a consistent uh, way, in a correct way. Whereas if it's a single author paper, then of course there is no one, no co-author who can check these uh, statistics. We will also, uh, um, using the sampling procedure, the subject category, so the subject category of each preprint that is uh, preprint servers or assigned by the preprint servers. And we will also take into account the date a preprint was actually published. And if we have a stratified random sample from the COVID-19 preprints, then we will select uh, randomly a matching non-COVID-19 preprint, which should serve as a control group. And by doing this, we actually conduct a natural experiment where we have an experimental group and a control group, both based on uh, existing groups. We will look at the number of statistics, number of statistics that we will extract from these preprints using uh, a protocol. So we will look at the percentage versus the number of events uh, cases. We will look at uh, the test properties. So we look at the accuracy, sensitivity, specificity, for instance, of a test. We will check whether the total sample size is in line with the subgroup sample sizes. So if subgroup sample sizes are reported, we will check whether these sample sizes sum up to the total sample size. We will also check whether the marginal values in a frequency, uh, in a frequency table uh, match with the values in the cells. We will compare p-values with test statistics, test statistics and degrees of freedom to see whether these two are in line. And finally, we will, always we will also compute effect sizes based on dichotomous data if uh, a frequency table is available. So based on the frequency table, we, for instance, compute this odds ratio, and then we compare this with the reported effect size. So we are very thankful that we got some funding for this project by uh, Tilburg University. And we could use this funding to hire two research assistants. And the idea is that they in total extract data from 2,400 preprints, so 1,200 preprints on COVID-19 research. 1200 preprints not on COVID-19 research and they are currently already collecting these uh, these data and they are about halfway so we need a bit more time for the uh, for the data collection and prior to starting the data collection we also did a power analysis a power analysis in a way where we um, try to figure out what the effect size would be that we could detect with 80 percent power because the funding is limited. So we know we can um, include approximately 2,400 preprints in our sample. And then we can detect an odds ratio of 1.38 with 80% power. So if the data are collected, then what we will do in the next step is we have written automatic scripts to check for statistical inconsistencies. And we will apply these scripts to all the data. And if there are inconsistencies detected, then we will double check these inconsistencies by hand. So we will go to these uh, preprints and then check whether these inconsistencies are indeed inconsistencies. In the next step, we will fit a logistic multi-level model 
with this dependent variable, whether a statistical result is consistent or not, and with this independent variable, whether a preprint is about COVID-19 uh, or not. And then we will run a frequent test hypothesis test to test our hypothesis with an alpha level of 0 0.205. And we will also compute a base factor, a base factor that is comparable to the um, to the frequent test uh, hypothesis test. And we repeat this analysis also with including some control variables. So we will include the number of authors and the extracted statistics of a preprint and also the date when a preprint was uh, published. We conducted the study, uh, or we are set up the study as a registered report. And this is also the reason why it took a bit longer to start with the data collection, because we first had to, had to pass this first stage of the registered report, the uh, stage where the introduction and method section, method section uh, are reviewed. So this was, uh, this was done and we got reviews from six different uh, reviewers. And in the end, the proposal was accepted as a stage one registered report at the uh, Royal Society for Open Science. And now we hope, since we already have all the materials, that stage two can quite easily be finish, uh, finished after all the data are collected, because we have already all the scripts. So we only basically need to run these scripts and write up the results. So we hope that this can be, that this will be a quite uh, straightforward process. And we also worked on a side project, a side project that is really related. And that is that we also want to enrich the preprints. And we want to enrich the preprints by posting short reports about the consistency or inconsistency of statistical results in a preprint. So such a report can, for instance, be um, added to the preprint via the preprint server, because we can post a report over there as uh, a comment. And such a report will add value to the preprints because it notifies the authors and then also the readers um, whether there are any statistical inconsistencies in the preprint. And I think what is very good about this is that if inconsistencies are observed in a preprint, that they can hopefully still be fixed before a preprint turns into a publication. And these reports were actually developed together with a research master student of our university, Hong Wai Zhao. So she spent a lot of time in developing and improving these, uh, these reports. Well, thank you for your attention. So unfortunately, I cannot uh, answer question questions now in person, but if you have any questions, any remarks, feel free to send me an email via this email address over here. Yep, so that's it. And um, I pasted Robbie's email into the chat. So yeah, if you have questions, uh, you can either put them in the Q&A and I'll get them to him, or you can uh, just email him. Uh, and then for the final talk, uh, this is kind of like that search for a Jeopardy host. I have in fact selected myself. Uh, and so I'll be talking about some privacy risks associated with open data. I'll go ahead and share my screen here. Okay, so hopefully that's all set up. Okay. <clears throat> And then first, um, before every talk these days, because I'm still working from home at the moment, I do need to apologize for my, my coworker. He has gotten very spoiled and does not like to be shut out of the office. So you may end up hearing some grumbles in the background. Uh, hopefully that will all be fine. So we'll be talking about uh, data privacy in openly available data sets. And I think this is uh, an important topic at the moment because we are seeing a rapid uptick in the sharing of open data. Other sessions, I suspect, will address this more closely, um, but multiple metrics are pointing this way from OSF usage to signatories to the top guidelines. And this is, of course, a great development. This is undoubtedly a good development for science, 
the pros greatly outweigh the cons. And I say that even after doing this project, uh, but I do think it presents some new avenues for risk that need to be managed. And so for example, uh, a dramatic demonstration that it's surprisingly easy to identify individuals using metadata. Um, one study found that the vast majority of American voters could be identified with only three pieces of metadata, zip code, gender, and date of birth. So if you're not mindful of this stuff, you can end up sharing data that's actually far more identifying than you intended. And so we ended up doing this project. Um, the sampling frame is a little disjointed because we're merging separate projects. And really we started this because we actually wanted to use these open data sets ourselves. And we were concerned that if we sampled a whole bunch, we'd end up resharing uh, personally identifying information. And so we didn't wanna be responsible ourselves for, for privacy violations. So we end up with a sample of three journals and a few different years for each. And then we took all of the, uh, almost all of the articles with open data from that sampling frame. We had two coders go through each data set and assess them for re-identification risk and the sensitivity of the data. Um, so that is whether you could identify an individual and then also whether the data touched on sensitive topics that someone would feasibly not want to be shared. And then uh, when we did detect problems, we informed authors. In many cases, these have already been corrected. And this was actually a, quite a bright point of this project was that authors were usually you know, not happy to hear that they had shared potentially uh, identifying information, but we're very fast to, to correct it and, and very thankful that we had alerted them. <clears throat> so how do we go about uh, assessing re-identification risk? Uh, we looked to the HIPAA safe harbor guidelines uh, as a starting point here, and we tried to classify each data set into three different categories. Uh, so HIPAA has some specific variables that need to be removed in order for a data set to be considered anonymous. For that, we're looking at concrete things like name, email, IP address, initials, birth date, and zip code. There's a larger list, but for us, these are the most relevant. And we categorize those as high risk. We categorize an additional set as some risk. This was data sets with rich data, uh, with rich demographics, which you could feasibly combine these and identify at least some of the individuals in those data, especially if there were outliers, for instance, maybe an outlier on age within a, a certain university major or something like that. And we also coded for sensitive data. Uh, for this, we looked to the GDPR guidelines because they also lay out some quite specific topics here. Uh, so here we're looking at things like racial or ethnic origin. I'll have more to say about this in a minute. Uh, political, religious, philosophical opinions, health-related data. And we include mental health there uh, since these are a lot of psychological data sets here. Uh, and data about sex life or sexual orientation. And again, we code these into three different categories. So if GDPR said it's sensitive, we categorize it as sensitive. If it didn't contain a GDPR violation, but we thought that a common person might still consider this sensitive, uh, we categorize it as possibly sensitive. Uh, and then uh, if there was just no, no, nothing sensitive at all, of course, that's uh, its own category. So each of these gray squares uh, represents a data set. And uh, we're gonna jump right into the results for data sensitivity. What we see is that overall, uh, about a quarter of the data sets contained at least potentially sensitive data. Um, most of this was definitely sensitive according to the GDPR. This is not that surprising. I mean, a lot of us research sensitive topics and it's not necessarily problematic as long as these are appropriately anonymized before they're shared. Breaking down the reasons, uh, the, the very first one is race or ethnic origin. Now this is frequently uh, collected and shared, I think, you know, in the US and other areas. So I'll just go ahead and say, I understand there's probably gonna be some disagreement on that. If we just ignore race, then it drops from 25% sensitive to 18% sensitive. Then after that, uh, in order, we have political views, health items. Oftentimes we'd see things like measures of depression, anxiety, um, then religious beliefs and sexual preferences or behaviors uh, to a lesser extent. And again, this is not necessarily problematic until we look at re-identification risk. So here, uh, ideally all of these squares will remain gray, but let's see. Unfortunately, we see that about 5% uh, pose a definite risk and an additional roughly 5% pose a potential risk that you could re-identify individual participants in these open data sets 
uh, with, the, with the publicly available information here. Getting into these reasons. So this light red, the light red bars here, this is all categorized as potential risk. And those are all cases where we deemed that the, the demographics were so rich that it was likely uh, or possible that you could identify individuals based on triangulating these, uh, these variables. And then in terms of concrete HIPAA identifiers, IP addresses uh, were quite common. They were the number one violation in terms of HIPAA. Uh, then we also saw date of birth fairly frequently. And then kind of just the flat out identifying information, names, initials, full names. Uh, we did also see some of that. Uh, I'll note that for some of these, like IP address, date of birth, we can kind of debate on exactly how identifying that is on its own. I'll note that in almost all of the cases that we observed, these were also accompanied by um, rich demographics that would allow you to further triangulate uh, down to an individual. Now, you may be thinking, uh, well, Rick, uh, you haven't demonstrated that there's a problem here because maybe if someone has a sensitive data set, they're particularly careful to de-identify it. And uh, unfortunately, we see that that's not the case. Uh, so if we narrow down to the 208 data sets that we observed with at least some risk of re-identification, we found that about half of those also contain sensitive data. And so it's actually the opposite. These data sets that have identifying information are also much more likely than um, those that did not to have, uh, in addition, sensitive data. And so this was about 5% of data sets overall. And I think these are the ones that are, are truly uh, quite problematic. So then the big question, should you care? Uh, I'm not gonna tell you how to live your life. I'll tell you that uh, the exact numbers here are debatable. They are subject to your definition. There's not always agreement. There was not always agreement between our coders. Uh, and if you're a cyber criminal in the audience, are you kind of licking your chops and just waiting to get in there and start exploiting these data? Probably not. I mean, there's, there's probably softer targets to consider. On the other hand, if I was a participant, uh, I would be pretty upset if I was giving you honest answers on a depression inventory, and then that was shared alongside my IP address. Uh, so I think there's, there's some room for debate here. And I would uh, moreover say that we didn't identify any cases where the really identifying information like IPs, like uh, names were actually used in the analysis. In other cases, for instance, date of birth was sometimes used in the analysis to derive an age, um, which can be rendered much less of a problem if you just convert it to age and then share age instead of the exact date of birth. Uh, so I would say we're not sacrificing any scientific utility by addressing this and either making sure that we're removing some of these variables or transforming them into less identifying versions. This does get tricky sometimes. Um, so I've put some resources here that you might refer to if you are in one of these uh, trickier situations, but the vast majority that we saw, simple changes to the data sets would have resulted in no loss in scientific utility and a great gain in terms of being unable to identify them. Then on to solutions. So I think the good news is that actually most of the cases we did catch were fairly easy. You know, if someone was just aware when they were submitting, did an extra check of their data, they would have spotted IP address and they would have said, we don't need that. and We shouldn't share that. And I think that's borne out by when we contacted people with these concerns, very often they just said, oh, you know, whoops, I'll correct that. So I think a little uh, education and awareness can go a long way. This could be simply in the form of, uh, you know, a check mark on a submission portal Kind of a higher reach goal would be maybe if you have editorial staff on, on staff that could both check for these sorts of issues and also, you know, while they're checking maybe data documentation, maybe code reproducibility. I realize that's kind of a, a larger investment. A simple tip just in your kind of personal research labs is that you might want to consider whether you're collecting unnecessary data that might be identifying. One of the major violators we saw, I think the majority of IP addresses that we saw were from Qualtrics data collections, which by default will collect IP address and insert it into your data set, whether you want it or not. Now you can turn that off. Uh, and maybe if you're not gonna use those data at all, just don't collect them in the first place. And then the one that I'm, I think most excited about uh, is that a lot of these violations follow semi-standard syntax that could be detected through regular expressions and the like. 
And so we actually submitted a, a grant about this. We're waiting to hear back and we might be developing an open source tool uh, that would be able to automatically flag these say, you know, before a researcher uploads their data, just, hey, we, we caught a few columns here. Do you actually wanna upload this, this column that appears to be IP addresses and stuff like that? Uh, but of course this wouldn't catch everything. And especially some of these cases with triangulating demographics uh, where it's really a kind of a judgment call uh, that would be more difficult to detect. So the takeaways for me, uh, I think open data is absolutely worth it. This shouldn't lessen our enthusiasm about open data, uh, but it's worth doing responsibly. And I think there are some simple and low cost interventions that at this point, if we implement them, uh, could really mitigate the risk moving forward as we see increasingly more data uh, going on. So thanks. And uh, at this point, I'll take questions on both my slide, and I think we can open it up to uh, to all of the presenters if anyone has some new questions there. Let me just get situated here. Uh, okay, so yeah, maybe no questions as of yet. So here's one going back to, uh, okay. Could you share the name of the standard that you used to code the data? You mentioned an early slide, but I missed it, HIPAA. Oh yeah. So. Uh, this is HIPAA, which is a, I'll paste it in chat, um, specifically the HIPAA safe harbor guidelines, which is a, it's a standard in, or it's a, it's a regulation in the United States that we used. And then I think there's a question for Marion also. Um, Oh no, we already answered this one. Ah, okay. Yeah, and I answered some of them uh, in uh, by by a bit text. <laughs> okay, great. And uh, yeah, we just have a few minutes. We can see if uh, any questions come to light here. And uh, if not, maybe we can just give uh, the West Coasters a little time for a power nap, maybe before the next session and uh, call it there. Uh, so thanks everyone for presenting. Uh, again, if anyone has questions for Robbie, uh, feel free to send those uh, directly to him via email. And uh, yeah, thanks for, thanks for listening.